Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very very important and clinical topic, the Bedside Brief Neurological Examination. The Bedside Brief Neurological Examination. If a person comes for a, for a checkup, for a review or maybe having non-neurological disorders or you are suspecting that there may be neurological disorder which is not obvious. So then we have to proceed with a quick brief bedside neurological examination to find out whether there is any neurological deficit or not. If in case there is a neurological deficit, then we can do a detailed neurological examination. So just to find out whether there is a neurological lesion is present or not, we need to do a brief bedside neurological examination. So what is the bedside brief neurological examination? Obviously this is not a detailed or a complete neurological examination. This is a fast examination to find out whether there is a neurological deficit or not. It's a fast but a not complete neurological examination just to find out whether there is a lesion or not, neurological lesion or not. Like the detailed neurological examination, even in the brief bedside neurological examination, we have to do a brief mental status examination, cranial nerve examination, motor reflexes, sensory and coordination and finally gait. Mental status. To begin with, we check out the attention. We use seven digits forwards and five digits backwards. Forwards, the length is more seven, but backwards it is only five. We give seven digits, we ask him to repeat immediately the seven digits. So repetition of seven digits immediately after hearing it is the test for attention. Why we give seven digits forwards and only five digits backwards? Because brain is used to reading forwards, not backwards. So reading forwards is easier than reading backwards. In our daily class as an example, we are used to reading or studying alphabets from A to Z. It is easy for any person to say from A to Z forwards, A, B, C, D, E, F, G till Z. But when you ask him to repeat backwards from Z to A, he may say Z, Y, X and then he starts thinking what is the letter which comes in a retrospective manner. So reading forwards is easier, reading backwards is difficult. Reading from A to Z or telling from A to Z is easy, but, but telling it out from Z to A backwards is difficult. So we give seven digit forwards and five digit backwards. Then language, the three important aspects we test for language is comprehension, whether he is able to understand it, repetition, whether he is able to repeat it, Fluency, whether he is able to speak fluently. Then the naming of objects, reading, writing. But important is that comprehension, repetition and fluency. At least about 100 to 150 words should be able to tell easily. When it comes to a less, to a very few words, then it becomes a uh, uh, Deficiency in fluency like Broca's aphasia, if he is not able to understand it becomes Wernick's aphasia and if he is not able to read it becomes a conduction aphasia, arcuate fasciculus. But if repetition is spared then we call it as transcortical aphasia because transcortical aphasia indirectly implies that the arcuate fasciculus is intact. So attention, language, then memory. We give three unrelated objects, ask him to repeat immediately that becomes immediate memory. We ask him to repeat the three unrelated objects after five to ten minutes, it becomes recent memory. Then his childhood memories or long term memories will become a long term memory. Visual spatial function. Visual spatial function is because basically of right parietal lobe. Right parietal lobe controls both right and the left, whereas left controls only the right extra personal space. So when the left gets affected, the right extra personal space gets affected, but this is compensated by the right parietal lobe which controls both the right and the left. 
and therefore the left parietal lobe lesions does not produce right hemineglet whereas if right parietal lobe gets affected both the right and the left gets affected this is compensated by the intact left parietal lobe there is no compensation on the left side so right parietal lobe or non dominant parietal lobe produces left hemineglet so hemineglet can be tested by putting numbers from 1 to 12 and ask him to draw and copy 1 to 12 if he puts all the numbers 1 to 12 only on the right side and does not go to the left side it is left hemineglet the visual spatial function is the depth perception done by the parietal lobe so we ask him to draw complex figures which he will not be able to do it then we test the frontal lobe functions ask him to generate as many as words possible in a particular category like animals or fruits so when we start to examine the mental status examination two things are very important one the person should be attentive unless the person is attentive we cannot test the higher functions second you should always check out on the handedness because more than 90 percent of the right handers the dominant cortex is the left side dominant cortex is that cortex where the speech centers are situated so 90 percent of the right handers the speech center is on the left side but 10 percent may be on the right side whereas in the left hander 60 percent still is on the left side but 40 percent may be on the right side so when you test the higher functions always we have to test the attention and the handedness next we talk about the cranial nerves so there are 12 cranial nerves that we can do it in a detailed examination if you find a deficit but a quick brief neurological assessment involves taking out the following nerves first now we do not test for a brief bedside examination because there's not going to be much significance so second cranial now we check out on the visual field visual acuity field of vision color vision pupil and fundus examination to find out whether the second nerve is involved second nerve is basically a central nervous system an extension of central nervous system so it is myelinated it is by oligodendrocyte obviously it is a, a part of central nervous system examination therefore second nerve gets affected in in lesions which affect the central nervous system in diseases which affect the central nervous system like multiple sclerosis so we have to check on the second nerve then we check the three four six nerves together because they are responsible for ocular movements all the ocular movements are done by the third nerve except fourth and six lr6 and so 4 superior oblique is supplied by the fourth nerve and lateral rectus is supplied by sixth nerve if there's a double vision on looking at far off objects it is sixth nerve palsy they are not able to adapt if there's a double vision on on near vision it is a third nerve palsy they are not able to adapt then we test the fifth and seventh cranial nerves fifth nerve is for the facial sensations seventh nerve is for the facial movements eighth nerve is not that important so we check on the ninth tenth eleventh nerves in the form of the palate and tongue movements 9 10 12 nerves in the form of palate and tongue movements then the motor examination we check out on the bulk whether there is atrophy or not if there is atrophy it is an LML lesion UML lesion usually do not produce much atrophy there may be disuse atrophy but not real atrophy real atrophy almost uh, when you see only bones and no flesh it indicates lower motor neuron lesion like poliomyelitis or, or anti cell disease like motor neuron disease then we check out on the tone whether there is rigidity or sparsity rigidity is length independent affects all groups of muscles equally seen in extra permanent disorders with tremors imposed cogwheel rigidity seen in parkinson's disease spasticity is length it is velocity dependent so initially it is difficult to overcome then it becomes easier to overcome the tone is increased in anti-gravity muscles that is flexor groups of the flexor muscles of the upper limb and the extensor muscles of the lower limb and therefore they flex the upper limb they extend the lower limb they cannot flex the knee and therefore when they walk they have to encircle and walk this is a classic circumduction gait and this is because of the sparsity increased in tone in the anti-gravity muscles that is the flexors of the upper limb and the extensors of the lower limb this is the explanation for the circumduction gait which we see in hemiplegic lesions that is the corticospinal tract lesions power Power again, we are not doing a detailed examination, we are doing a brief bedside examination to find out whether there is any neurological deficit or not. The best, single best test for power, uh, for, for any kind of minute corticospinal tract lesion is pronator drift. We ask him to extend the hands and then see whether there is any pronation. If there is pronation, it indicates that the supinator group of muscles supplied by the corticospinal tract is weak and therefore there is pronation 
So pronator drift is a very sensitive indicator of a corticospinal tract lesion and therefore when we check out for power, always we check out on pronator drift, especially when we think that there may be a neurological lesion but it is not obvious. Then upper limb distal muscles we check by the touching of the thumb with the fingertips of the all other four fingers. So this is a very easy and quick way of testing the distal group of muscles of the upper limb. The proximal muscles of the lower limb are tested by asking to get up from the squatting to the standing position and the distal muscles of the lower limb are tested by asking to walk on the heels or toes. If the person is able to walk well on the toes that means plantar flexion is good that means uh, S1 is good, Elf, uh, uh, plantar flexion is good. If the person is able to walk on the heels, that means the dorsiflexion is good, that means L5 is good. Reflexes. We test the reflexes for biceps, supinator, triceps, knee and ankle. We all know that if there is a lesion, an LM lesion produces loss of reflexes and a UM lesion produces a exaggeration of reflexes and therefore if there is a lesion, example at C7, the biceps will be normal, brachioradialis will be normal because they are sci fi C6, but triceps C7 will be lost and below the level it will be exaggerated. So knee jerk and ankle jerk will be exaggerated. So how do we localize the lesion by deep tendon jerks? At the level of the lesion there is LMN signs, below the level of the lesion there are UMN signs. Next we check out on the Babinski side, we bring the stimulus from the lateral part to the medial part of the heel and then see whether there is a toe extension or flexion. Toe extension indicates an extensor plantar response that, that means the lesion is above S1. Normally there is there's toe flexion but there is a toe extension and, and fanning of the other toe it indicates a Babinski sign that means the lesion is above S1. Then we check out on the sensory first the touch we test with the wisp of cotton. We check the spinothalamic tract sensations that is the pain and temperature sensations. Temperature we can put test tubes with cold water and hot water and test it and for pain we do a pinprick examination. Then we test the vibration joint position sense carried by the posterior column. Vibration sense we put the tuning fork 128 hertz on the bony prominence and see whether the vibration is present or lost. If it is present we compare with the other side and then see whether when it disappears on one side, it at the same time disappears on the other side or continues to have vibration. If it continues to have vibration, that means the, the bony prominence tested for in the first place, at first, it is affected. So when it is affected in the distal most part, then we start moving to the proximal parts. The joint position sense is tested by asking him to place an, uh, a limb in, in the space and ask him to lift the other limb and place in the exact position or we move the joints and say and the person should be able to say whether it's gone upwards or downwards especially the toes or we can test objectively by Rombox and ask him to stand with feet closed, hand extended and eyes closed. If he's got a tendency to fall that means the proprioception is affected. Now normally the balance is done by three systems the ocular system, eyes, vestibular cerebellum and posterior column. These three systems act in unison to, to give a good sense of balance to a human being. If one of these three systems do not work, the person will have difficulty in having balance. If two systems are affected, person definitely will have imbalance. So when we ask him to stand with feet closed and hands extended and imagine the posterior joint sense is affected, posterior column is affected, still he is able to have balance to some extent because the ocular system is intact, vestibular cerebellum system is intact. But when we ask him to close the eyes, the second system also, the visual cues also we are removing. The system is, second system is also removing. So he will have a severe fall. This indicates that the posterior column is affected. <coughs> Coordination, target accuracy, especially for cerebellum is concerned with the, with the precise movement. So we do target accuracy, ask him to touch the nose with the fingertip. If the cerebellum is affected, either there is undershooting or overshooting. We again test the rhythmic movement, rapid alternating movements. If cerebellum gets affected, they will have difficulty in performing rapid alternate movements known as dysdirecokinesia. Then finally, gait. <coughs> if cerebellum is affected, person cannot stand with, with feet close together. He has to spread his feet apart so that he gets balance. So wide base stance indicates that the cerebellum is affected. 
then we look at the gate whether it's got circumduction gate that means it indicates a hemiplegia due to corticospinal tract lesion a stamping gate indicates a posterior column high stepping gate indicates a common peroneal nerve palsy if a person has got ataxic gate it is indicates cerebellum if a person has got waddling gate it indicates a proximal segment like gluteus medius is got parkinsons is a fessian gate and short stepping gate so looking at the gate we can get lot of clues and then we look at the arm swing when he walks the arm on the affected side is not swinging that means it could be parkinsons disease so these are all the neurological examination components which we do it very quickly and rapidly at bedside a brief bedside examination to find out first of all is there any neurological lesion or not if if in case there is a neurological lesion then we can do a detailed neurological examination so this is a brief best bedside neurological examination i hope you have enjoyed listening to my lecture if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel or please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr sinos medical concepts and my page dr sinos concepts thank you bye